If you haven't got an outline in your hand, uh, raise up your hand and somebody's going to get you one. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to pick it up off of our website already, if it's up there already, but uh, we would also like to welcome all of our internet audience uh, and whether people are watching our live stream or whether they will watch on demand off of our YouTube channel, welcome. Let's get into the Word and let's cr trust God that there's a fresh revelation in each and every one of our hearts regarding the subject of divine healing. Just a bit later on, we're going to share communion together. We're going to tie it all together today. Um, and uh, the title of this series of messages is Redigging the Wells of Divine Healing. Redigging the Wells of Divine Healing. And uh, the idea and the concept there is from the Old Testament where Abraham uh, and his servants dug some wells for themselves and for their livestock. And the Bible says that when Abraham moved on and Isaac came along, that some of the enemy had come in to fill up the wells and to contaminate them. Uh, so Isaac had to redig the wells all over again so that they're able to draw water. And you know, I'm mindful that sometimes there's people uh, that have believed and understood divine healing, but through a series of circumstances, perhaps a, 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 a situation that hasn't quite worked out in the way that they wanted to, and their well got contaminated. And the well is like a revelation that we go to the Word, we go before God with a revelation to receive healing. And that's what these messages are all about. We are redigging the well of salvation. For some of you, it is exactly that. Uh, for others of you, it's digging it for the first time. You didn't know that healing was available to you and I today. Uh, it is part of the new covenant uh, part of the blessing that God makes available to us today by faith. And so with that, uh, I'm going to do a quick recap, and then we'll carry on from there. But in Exodus 15, verse 26, God revealed Himself uh, as the Lord our healer, as Jehovah Rapha. He said to the people there, I am the Lord who heals you. And uh, we said that supernatural healing uh, for our bodies from sicknesses, from diseases, from pains, etc., etc., is available to us today because of Christ's redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. And Matthew 8, verse 16 says that Jesus cast out the spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. And last week we made three points. Number one, we said that the gospel of the kingdom includes physical healing for our body. All right, when Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, it included divine healing. Then number two, we said that the devil always tries to put healing off into the future. The devil can't deny healing today because it is a well-established truth across the board, but his subtle trick is to push it off into the future, so it's always just out of reach. And then we said that number three, that healing is not just for today, but healing is for right now. All right, all we need to do is receive it. And once we have faith, once we have a revelation, we're able to reach out and receive it and lay a hold of it and keep a hold of it until it's fully manifest in our body. So this morning, I would like to uh, carry on from there and swing into the book of Numbers, chapter 21, Old Testament, book of Numbers. Um, and uh, in verse 4, uh, I want to pick up a story here where the Israelites uh, had left Egypt. They were en route to the promised land. Um, and tragically, a journey that should have taken about six days uh, Seven, eight, maybe 10, 14 days at the most lasted 40 years. And they wandered around and around and around for 40 years. And in the end, uh, because of their griping, their complaining, their resistance to God's commands, uh, their uh, despondency and, and their rebellion against authority and against their leaders and so forth, in the end, God says that He wasn't going to let that generation who, whom he called a stiff-necked generation. He wasn't going to let him into the promised land. But he says, your children, whom you say are going to die out in the wilderness, God says, I'm going to take them on into the promised land. Forty years. And uh, again, the devil managed to stir these people up and to trick them into uh, having wrong thinking, wrong believing, wrong speaking, and wrong action. And he cut them out of the blessing of God. 
The reason why we teach the Word is because we need to be taught on how to flow with God and how to cooperate with God so that we can get in line uh, with God's purposes for our lives and lay a hold of everything that God has for us. Is anybody excited this morning? All right. So... Uh, these people journeyed, it says here in verse 4, uh, they journeyed from Mount Hor, by the way, of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul lulls this worthless bread." Now, get the story here. They're walking. It took a bit longer. They were a bit tired by now. The Bible says their soul became discouraged. Just watch discouragement, my friend, because it'll cause you to think things that we shouldn't be thinking. It'll cause you to say things we shouldn't be saying, and it causes us to do things that we shouldn't be doing. And so that's exactly what happened here. These people began to speak against God. They began to, to complain rather than being grateful that God's delivered them from slavery. They had a very short memory. They didn't like Egypt because it was a horrible place, but they had a, a few you know, uh, days of journey ahead of them, and because it was a little bit tougher and rougher than what they thought it would be, I thought, oh, we want to go back to Egypt. Um, and uh, Sometimes Christians, you know, when they get born again, and then after a while they talk about the good old days, you know, like the good old days before they got saved. Listen, they were in good old days. They were bad days. We were in the good days now. We were in the kingdom now. This is the good life. All right, uh, and, uh, and so as I say, sometimes the devil manages to twist people's minds and gets them uh, discouraged, and then they begin to say things that ultimately work against them. Now they're speaking against God's provision. God provided manna for them. Uh, God provided for water for them to come out of the rock. It was just a marvelous life, really, uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, they began to complain. Uh, so in verse 6, it says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take the serpents from us. Take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that anyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone. Everybody say anyone. All right, so anybody, not just select people, but anybody. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. All right, so we have a marvelous story here from which we can derive some wonderful truths. Uh, again, we're talking about the whole subject of divine healing. We're not talking about uh, getting, uh, you know, healed by, you know, with the help of medical professions. Uh, God doesn't need that. I mean, if we need it, let's have it and let's, uh, you know, draw from it. It's wonderful what medical profession is able to do today, but medical profession is still very, very limited. All right. Proof of that is that many, many people die before their time, uh, but God is unlimited. God says, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. And for us to enjoy long life, it means that uh, we've got to have a healthy life. So let's pick the story up here and uh, talk about that situation where uh, the Israelites, a couple of three million people, possibly a few more, traveled through the wilderness. Uh, this is kind of desert, uh, wilderness, uh, arid lands, uh, and yet there are snakes out there. Um, and the Bible speaks about these fiery serpents. Now, these fiery serpents, um, probably a better, a better translation might have been burning serpents. Uh, and the reason why they called them fiery or burning serpents is because when those snakes bit somebody, there was a terrible burning pain that came on, and then eventually people died. So that's why they called them burning, um, burning uh, serpents, because they produced a burning pain, a very intense pain, uh, and then in the end people died from it. 
fiery serpents, burning serpents, it doesn't matter. These snakes uh, came into the camp, and the amazing thing is that the Bible says that the Lord sent the snakes. Now, I'm not saying that the, what the Bible says is not true, but get this. The serpents were already out there. They were already in the wilderness. God didn't suddenly create some snakes to bring them into the camp. They were already all around them. And while the people obeyed God, and while they did what God told them to do, go where God told them to go, and, 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 and sort of follow and lo- along, and, 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 uh, and be appreciative of their leaders, and so forth, while the people did that, there was a hedge of protection around about the camp, and these serpents couldn't get in. And when the Bible says, uh, you know, that the Lord sent the serpents, if we were to jump on board with that and really go to town in it, we could make God guilty of this whole deal. But actually, it's the people that were guilty. The people's sin caused that hedge of protection to lift off of their lives, uh, off of the camp as it were, and suddenly there are snakes coming into the camp. And the Bible says that many, many people were bitten and uh, they ended up dying. Um, so the people came to Moses and they said, oh, Moses, Moses, uh, we're sorry. We spoke against you. We spoke against God. Please, Moses, pray for us. You know, at least, uh, you know, when, you know, I'm not in any way saying that these people are any, any worse than anybody else, but you know, human nature, um, and uh, at least they realized that they'd done wrong, and then they repented of the wrong that they'd done. They acknowledged that they had spoken against Moses, against God, and they repented of it, and they asked for prayer, which is the right thing to do. And God, in His mercy, provided the answer for the problem that actually they had created. You see, God didn't create the problem. Uh, the problem was just outside the camp, but their sin caused that protection of God to lift off of their lives, and snakes came in, and these snakes started to bite the people. So they came to Moses, and they says, Moses, we've done wrong. Um, please pray for us. Um, and Moses did. So Moses prayed, um, and they said, please take the snakes away. Um, well, God answered in a very specific way, not necessarily exactly in the method that they asked for. Um, they said, look, let the snakes go, go, go out of the camp again. Well, the snakes are already in now. Um, but God says to Moses, all right, Moses, I want you to make a fiery serpent. I want you to make one of those replica snakes. And um, Moses made it out of bronze. They knew how to work with bronze. Um, and uh, presumably the color of these snakes would have been bronzy type color. Uh, and uh, because the wording is exactly the same, that they were fiery um, serpents that came into the camp to bit the people. And when the Bible says that Moses, uh, God instructed Moses to make a fiery serpent and put it up on a pole. All right, so it was like a replica. Um, the difference between one and the other is that the, the, the ones that came into the camp were live serpents, uh, but the serpent on the ball was just a replica. It was just an image of a serpent. So God says, make this serpent and put it up on a pole and uh, lift it up. And when anybody anywhere in the camp gets bitten, when they look to that serpent, they shall be healed. Amazing story. Uh, quite obviously, the camp was huge. Sometimes we see drawings of that many people uh, camped out in the wilderness. If you took an aerial view uh, of the camp, God had instructed them to have uh, a couple of tribes, three tribes to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And in the very center of it, they'd set up their what we call the tabernacle of Moses, which was the, the place of worship where they would come together. Amazingly, if you looked this, at this thing from an area of viewpoint, you'd see a cross. You'd see people in the north, in the south, in the east, and in the west, and in the very center of it, you'd have the tabernacle of Moses. The camp was huge. Um, the people would have uh, had their, you know, their tents everywhere. They would have walked around. Uh, they were out in the, in the morning gathering manna and so forth. And, uh, and uh, so quite clearly for somebody to be um, you know, bitten by a snake, and if they realized that a snake had bitten them before the pain was going to sit on and before they were going to die, they had to quickly look at this snake that was lifted up. So very clearly, uh, 
That pole had to be high. The serp serpent had to be a reasonable size so that people could see it from anywhere in the camp. And that's exactly what happened. When anybody looked at this serpent on the pole, they were healed. And the Bible says they lived. So in other words, they no longer experienced those burning pains. And uh, they no longer died from that snake bite, but they were healed from it. Now, this serpent on a pole, I would like to submit to you and remind you, because many of you already know this, that this serpent on the pole was a type of Jesus Christ that would be crucified on a pole, crucified on a cross some 1,500 years later. And here in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, here is Jesus himself speaking. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, Son of Man is Jesus Christ, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It's like the imagery here is amazing. Whoever rejects Jesus Christ will experience terrible burning. You know, hell is a place of burning and of great suffering. Hell is also a place of spiritual death. And hell is a place of eternal separation from God. And right there, when Jesus started his ministry, and he came amongst the people, and he began to teach them. And in this instance here, he said exactly that. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well, what, what serpent was that? The very serpent that God instructed Moses to make. Um, he made it out of bronze, stuck it on a pole, and lifted it up high. So somebody must have, must have stood there to lift up the serpent and to hold it up high all the time. You know, you and I, we are called to preach Christ and Him crucified. You know, it's wonderful, everything that we're able to do in the community, for the community. We reach people through any means that we can, but in the end, we have to preach, preach Christ to people. Because the Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And we help people to, you know, get this, get that, and get the other, and get them back on their feet. But if they don't get saved, they still go to hell. All right, so somebody has to preach Christ. But the amazing thing here is that in this very instance, uh, and of course, Jesus knew the Old Testament <laughs> better than anybody else, um, and the people knew the Old Testament. And when Jesus turned up, he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not experience burning, will not experience death, but have everlasting life. I know if you can see this, but I think this is quite profound. Jesus wasn't in any way cras clasping at all, what, plucking things out of the air. He very specifically identified the serpent that Moses lifted up, that image, with himself. This serpent that Moses lifted up was a type of Jesus Christ. We speak about Old Testament in types and shadows. That all the sacrifices, everything that took place in the Old Testament, their whole system, their sacrificial system of killing, killing lambs and goats and bulls and offering this and offering that and offering that, it all pointed to Jesus Christ coming, who is what Bible scholars call the antitype. Now, I don't want to make things very complicated, but there are the types, and Christ himself is the antitype. And what's amazing here is that healing was well established in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that you and I, in the New Testament now, we had a better covenant established on better promises. For anybody to argue that healing is not included in the New Testament when it was part of the Old Testament, that would be ludicrous because God couldn't call it a better covenant established on better promises. Healing is very much included in the Old Testament, but what is now included for us that wasn't included in the Old Testament is that we can be born again. 
all right? That we are delivered from the power of darkness. We are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And I can see that some of you are getting really excited just about right now. So Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, but He's also our healer. He's the healer of our spirit by bringing us to the born-again experience. He's the healer of our soul by healing broken-hearted people, by healing people of, of uh, terrible emotional trauma and grief and, and, and uh, bad memories. But He's also the healer of our bodies where physical healing is available to you and to me today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, Christ had no sin, but God made him become sin, so that Jesus, that rather in Christ, we could become right with God. Or as one translation says, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. I sometimes uh, share this, that when I first heard teaching around that pole that Moses was instructed to, you know, to put the snake on and to lift it up, and then that that was tied back to Jesus Christ, I just really struggled. I just, I just found it hard to connect the dots. You see, a serpent is, in terms of imagery, the very epitome of evil. The devil came into the Garden of Eden in the form of, of a serpent, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, we haven't got any snakes in, in New Zealand. But where I grew up, we had a few snakes. They were not particularly nasty ones. They were just ugly. They were just, I just, personally, uh, I'm not a fan of snakes. They're just, uh, they're just a creepy animal. Uh, <laughs> you might like them. You might think that they're fascinating, but they, they give me the creeps. All right, <laughs> snakes too. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the very image that Moses was told to lift up, was an image of a snake. And anybody that looked to the snake got healed. As I said, that messed with my head. That messed with my limited understanding of theology. I just couldn't get my head around it. But it was not until I came to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ was made sin. He was made sin. You see, Jesus not only carried your sin, and my sin, so we can be forgiven. But he was actually made sin. He became sin personified. And when he hung on the cross, when even God himself turned away from his son, and Jesus cried out, and he says, uh, he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That even God the Father turned away from him. And here was on the cross, that Jesus not only carried our sin, He was made sin. All the judgment of every sin that's ever been committed has been laid on Jesus Christ at that moment. And as I said, when I saw that, it made greater sense that uh, people could be healed by looking at a snake because it wasn't the snake per se. It was the type and the image and the shadow of looking forward to Jesus Christ, where you and I have got the benefit of history now. We look back and we know that Jesus Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago. We know that all the sins have been laid on Him so we can be uh, born again today. We can be forgiven. That all of our sicknesses, all of our diseases, and indeed all of our pains were laid on Jesus so that we don't have to carry them anymore. Furthermore, we're speaking about the full gospel. All our poverty was laid on Jesus because the Bible even tells us that He became poor for us, that we through His poverty might be made rich. So we totally believe in the full gospel. Yes, we believe in being born again, but it doesn't stop that there's a whole package deal that is available to you and to me today um, because of it, this whole thing being a covenant blessing that is available to us today. So Jesus became sin. Book of Isaiah, and I want to turn there a bit later on before we share communion together. 
book of Isaiah chapter 53 uh, describes what Jesus Christ experienced when He hung on the cross and leading up to it. We speak about the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, telling us of the life and the ministry of Jesus, but also His death and His resurrection. Sometimes, Bible scholars refer to Isaiah chapter 53 as the fifth gospel because it speaks about Christ from beginning to end. But it doesn't look at Christ with natural eyes to describe, you know, how the Romans captured him and then hung him up on the cross. But it looks at it with the eye of the Spirit to see what took place in the realm of the Spirit. That all of our sins were laid on him. How would you be able to see that with physical eyes? You can't see it, but you can see it if you look in the, in the realm of the Spirit. And Isaiah chapter 53 describes that in fine detail. All of our sicknesses, all of our diseases, all of our pains were laid on him. It's just a, a quick side note, important to mention. Um, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4, in some translations, it says that he was acquainted with our sicknesses and with our pains, that he carried our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But many modern translations, it seems that when they got to that place, the translators were a bit uneasy because they began to impose their theological position on that translation, and they called it griefs and sorrows. It's kind of watering down the real truth of the Bible, that Jesus not only carried our sins, but He carried our sicknesses and He carried our diseases. And so that's why, as I said, that's why we don't just preach or study the Bible from one version. We go across many versions and we go back to the original text because sometimes some of the translations have been weakened from their true meaning because the translators got cold feet like, ah, we are not sure if that's possible, so they sort of watered things down a little bit. Uh, but as I will be reading just a bit later on, uh, there are some translators who absolutely translated what they saw in the language and absolutely did not in any way let their theological position get in the way. So let me say it again. Jesus Christ became sin, and He carried our sins. On the cross, he, 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 he was made sick with all of our sicknesses. And when they laid the, the stripes, the whips to his body, before they took him up on the hill to crucify him, they took those uh, whips, what they called, uh, they, called, they had whips with different strains of leather. And into those bits of leather, they tied bits of bone. So when they would whip somebody, the stripes would come around and wrap themselves around their body. The bone would dig into the skin and into the flesh, and then they'd yank it back again. And uh, I say a 50. Two, the latter part of the chapter says that his visage was so marred more than any man. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was barely recognizable as a human being because everything messy and yucky and horrible from sin spiritually to sickness physically to pains and everything was laid on him to carry it sacrificially so that you and I have to carry it no more. You know, Paul the Apostle, I know I'm sort of bouncing around a bit. <laughs> Paul the Apostle said that three times he had received the, the whip or the stripe, what they used to call 40 save one. It was just saying 39 stripes, 39 whippings. And sometimes people say, you know, Jesus received 39 stripes. No, 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 no. Only the Jews had such a law that you were not allowed to whip beyond 39 times. The Romans were a cruel people. They were the nastiest people on the face of the earth at that time. They were just a cruel people. They had no such law. They kept on whipping and kept on whipping and kept on whipping uh, and, and, and didn't count. 
It's until they felt satisfied in themselves. So, your friend, I know I'm describing a horrible picture, but the, the, the Bible describes that for us so that you and I can be healed. So we can have faith that everything has already been laid on Jesus. Every pain, every fever, every bit of cancer, every tumor, every leukemia, every asthma and every other allergy, every pain was all laid on Christ. And that's why the Bible says that by His wounds we are healed. By His stripes we are healed. Let me bounce on into the New Testament. Um, read a passage of Scripture here from Luke chapter 5. And in Luke 5, Jesus had come back to his, uh, his town, his city, where he lived at the time, which was Capernaum. He grew up in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth. He's now, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's now based in Capernaum, and he's going out to preach, coming back home again periodically. Bible says on a certain day in verse 17, it happened that as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, man brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. When they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up, what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. What a marvelous situation. The Bible says that, in fact, that the same story is told in three Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. In Mark's, in, in Luke's, uh, in, in Mark's account, we are told that Jesus was in the house. So uh, it is assumed that it was uh, Peter's house, where Jesus would have been staying at at the time. And the Bible says that Pharisees had come around and scribes. The scribes were the people who uh, copied the, 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 the Old Testament by hand. They were scribes and they were the record keepers. They were also, the Bible speaks of experts of the law. They were the teachers of the Word of God and so forth. They all came around uh, and Jesus is in the house. Now, you know, if you're in a public a uh, place somewhere, there's more room for more people, but Jesus in a, is in a, in a dwelling place. He's in a domestic house. So next minute, the place is absolutely chocker. Um, and the uh, Bible says that Jesus was teaching the Word to these people. He's teaching the Word. Um, nobody could get in. Uh, inside, everything is chocker. Out in the hallway, if there was one, everything's chocker. People would have been outside around the house. Everything is absolutely chocker. Jesus teaching the Word. Um, and there's a profound statement in here that you and I ought to take note of. The Bible says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, I would like to suggest to you that Jesus didn't just teach the Word in the general sense, 
but he, will, he would have also taught on healing. Because remember last week, uh, we, we talked about the fact that Jesus was teaching, preaching, and healing. That was kind of his message. That was his modus operandi. And as he was teaching the word, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Them. To heal them. All right. Now, <laughs> What tends to happen is when we preach the word on any given subject, faith comes. And, uh, and the power of the Lord is present to demonstrate what we've just preached on. All right. Now, we've been speaking, uh, preaching on healing for some time. The power of the Lord is present to heal right now. All we need to do is learn on how to reach out and receive it by faith and lay a hold of it. Amazingly, the Bible tells us that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Them, plural. Now, there would have been a bunch of people. We can only guess. I think it would be safe to say that there could have been 20, 30 uh, people if it was a larger home. Uh, you know, business, uh, should I say, Peter was a businessman. He was a fisherman. He certainly wasn't a, wasn't a poor bloke. He had a fishing boat. So he had a business um, per adventure, there might have been uh, a larger room, which is like, you know, in the book of Acts, it speaks about the upper room. Uh, now, they were not in the upper room, <laughs> and I'll come to that in a moment. There might have been a large gathering place. might have been 40, 50 people. Who knows? But in the end, you're limited as to how many people you fit into one house. But the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Based on the law of averages, you get 20, 30, 40 people together, there will be a, a number of people that will be sick, just to, based on the law of averages. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them, to heal them all. But as we read to the end of the story, we see that only one man got healed, the others went home sick again, which is a tragedy because the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So, the Pharisees hadn't come to look at Jesus as their healer. They come to scrutinize him. They come to trip him up. They come to ensnare him. So they would have come sick. They went home sick. You know, the way that we look at Jesus determines what we're going to get from him. Um, when Moses was told to lift up the serpent in the wilderness... Everybody was told, if you get bitten, look to that pole, to that serpent, and you will be healed. They all would have looked to that serpent for their healing. And we all, and of course, that thing was a, was a, a, um, a type of Jesus Christ. We all look to Jesus Christ as our healer. Not only as our Savior, but we look to him as our healer. Now, these guys didn't come to be healed by him. They came to trip him up. So it's as we view Jesus will determine what we're going to get from him. And uh, there was some man that came, man plural, that brought their friend along on a stretcher. And uh, presumably there might have been four. Um, one carrying each end of the stretcher. They tried to get into the house, but the house is chocker, full of people. Can't get in. But they knew that the healer is inside. So what they do is they climbed up on the roof and... Uh, Broke open the roof. The uh, Bible says that they removed some tiling, so presumably that roof had some sort of a tiles on there that could be lifted off and to kind of open the inside of the house. And as Jesus is preaching there, he's sort of looking, and there's a commotion going on. There's suddenly daylight coming through there. And next minute, there's a guy coming down, <laughs> lying on a stretcher, held by ropes, and these uh, mates of his let the man down right before Jesus. You know, presumably, presumably, there's people everywhere. You know, I've been in some tight spaces in some tight places where we are teaching the Word. You know, like, uh, as I said, when we were up in Asia last year, like, I, I'm, I'm sort of sitting down, you know, teaching the Word during morning devotion. There's people, like, right there, you know. But generally, people leave a bit of space between the person doing the speaking and where they sit. And that very space... These guys timed it, and they, they worked it out in such a way that they wasn't going to let the man down way back in the, in, the, in the end of the lounge, but they let him down right in front of Jesus. Friend, let me tell you that 
the closer we get to Jesus, the more likely we will receive our healing. And there's just no easy way to put this. It's like if we are distant, way, way away, some in some distance, we need to get like, like close, close to Jesus and look right to him. And so these guys let the man down right before Jesus on ropes, and that would have been some feet. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be horrible, but I have been involved with funerals. I don't mean officiating at a funeral, but I've been involved with funerals uh, when the casket gets lowered down. And in the old days, when people would still hold ropes and lower down the casket, and it's hard going, like this is very heavy. Um, but here they're letting down a guy that's not dead. He's, he's, he's alive, but he's paralyzed. He can't move. So they let this guy down right before Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. How did he see their faith? He saw their faith by their actions. They went through all sorts of rigmarole to get their friend right before Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. See, faith is visible. Faith can be heard by the words we speak, and faith can be seen by our actions. Now, I've got a little, little recommendation here for you and for me. When there's a call made in a gathering such as this, and we say, okay, we're now going to pray for people who are sick. Come down and uh, let's pray for you. And if you're like, oh, shall I, shan't I? Oh, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, m maybe I should, you know. And you hesitate. You hesitate. And you hesitate. That hesitation where you're sitting will hinder you by the time you get down here from receiving. Because by your very action, by your very action, you are speaking of a double-minded man. James chapter 1, verse 8 Bible says that he's unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. It's not that God doesn't want, want to heal a double-minded man, but a double-minded man will have great difficulty in receiving the healing because that whole hesitation. So what I'm saying to you now is when a call is made uh, and you've got sickness in your body and, and you need healing, get down quickly. Your very quick action will help you to quickly receive. All right, is everybody okay with that? Just a recommendation. So here you go. Um, Jesus saw their faith. And then he looked down at the man and he says, uh, he says to the man, he says, uh, he says, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. The man's still lying down. He, he's now forgiven. Now, technically, that man's sins were forgiven on credit. Because Jesus was going to die on the cross and pay for the man's sins some two, three years later. But Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees sitting there who had come to scrutinize, to trip him up, to see if Jesus would say anything that they could use against him. But, ah, here it is. Here it is. He's claiming to be God. He's, he says there's nobody that can forgive sins except God. And of course they talked amongst themselves, and the Bible says that Jesus not only heard their words, but he also perceived their reasoning in their heart. And he says, why do you reason amongst yourselves that I say that, uh, that you know, your sins have forgiven you? And then he made a very profound statement. He says, which is easier to say, son, your sins have forgiven you, or rise up and walk and be healed? Which is easier? Which is easier? And so he turned to the man, and he said to the Pharisees, and that you guys may know that I've got the power to forgive sins. He says, rise up and walk. And th with that very command, the power God got released into that paralyzed man's body, and he was healed, and he stood up off of that stretcher that he was lying on. He picked the stretcher up, and he walked out the door glorifying God. <laughs> so what I would like to submit to you today that in Jesus' mind, it is as easy to get somebody healed as it is to get somebody saved. Once somebody comes in faith to receive whether that's salvation or receive healing, it's, it's easy. He says, which is easier? 
And somehow there was like a profound deal going on where Jesus initially said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. And they quarrel amongst themselves that only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus says, all right then. He says that you may know that I've got the power to forgive sins, power to forgive sins, power to forgive sins, rise up and walk. There's a connection between sins forgiven and divine healing that once we're born again, we are absolutely, we are absolutely eligible for healing in our body. And God will not in the slightest hesitate when we come to Him in faith to receive healing and He will not push one back and, you know, heal another it, because healing is already there. It's already here now. The power of the Lord is present now. The question is, who cares to reach out and receive it? Who cares to lay a hold of it? So in the end, only the, the lame man received his healing for his body. Everybody else went home sick. What made the difference? His mates and him were looking at Jesus as their healer. The other looked at Jesus as just something else. Something else. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that anybody is here this morning that you would have come to scrutinize Jesus, that you would have come to try to trip him up and, uh, and so forth. But sometimes we can limit Jesus. If we only look at him as our savior and not as our healer, then we're only going to receive him and we're going to experience only from him what we look to him for. But we look to him for the fullness of whom God made him to be then everything is available to you and to me by faith today. Number three, I'm moving quickly now. If you need healing from sickness or disease, you need to look at Jesus Christ as your healer. Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Since Jesus has risen from the dead, He's still the same today. He has not changed. And He will not change throughout eternity. Jesus Christ is both God and He's also 100% man. In the Old Testament, it was Jehovah. In the New Testament, it's Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God, Jehovah, in the book of Malachi chapter 3 says, I'm the Lord, I do not change. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's the difference between the two? None. He does not change. What he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing today. What he did last year, he's still doing today. If you've experienced healing 5, 10 years ago, what you experienced back then, if you need to today, he's still doing that today. See, Jesus doesn't fluctuate. The Bible says in God there is no variation, there is no shadow of turning. Jesus does not have uh, like, you know, one side to him and then another side to him. He's both God and he's both man, absolutely, but he's good always. Uh, he's not fickle. He's not like, you know, like, oh, okay, uh, depending on how I feel today is what you will experience. You know, Jesus is constant. He is the same and, you know, all we need to do is get our faith to be constant rather than our faith fluctuating. And, uh, and uh, by what, you know, by what we have experienced. Sometimes people say, I believe in healing because I've seen somebody healed. But I say, I believe in healing because I see it in the Word. Because if people believe in healing because they've seen somebody healed then what happens if they see somebody that doesn't get healed and their well of divine healing and their revelation will get contaminated? And this is where we are today, friends. Uh, there's way too many Christians that die way too early, but God is not changed. God is still, you know, Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Going to wrap up shortly. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Friend, if you need healing in your body, don't look at yourself. 
Look at Jesus. Don't look at your sickness. Look at Jesus. Don't, get, don't look at your failings and your shortcomings. And don't let the devil remind you when it's time to receive your healing of what you've done wrong yesterday, last week, or last month. Don't let the devil do that. Don't think about yourself or your failings or your shortcomings. Look at Jesus. Don't look at what other people are doing, or for that matter, don't listen to what other people are saying. Because people are people. Somebody will try to encourage you in the area of healing. Somebody else will try to talk you into that you've done something wrong you're not deserving of healing but friend healing today is like salvation it's not about whether we deserve it or not it's by God's grace it's absolutely by God's grace we receive salvation by grace through faith we receive healing by grace through faith we receive deliverance by God's grace through faith in the last scripture here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find the grace to help in time of need. Come boldly, God says. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can come boldly. God says, don't grovel. God says, don't beg. God is not motivated by begging. Faith does not beg. Faith knows how to lay a hold of that which God's Word has promised because faith is exactly that. Faith is the result of a thorough understanding of what belongs to us today. So if I can call on the ushers now to come forward to distribute the uh, communion uh, emblems and we will uh, share communion together. And uh, in the process, uh, once everybody has been served, I would like to also invite the worship team to come and um